Good morning. We want to say welcome to you on this Easter morning. We are thrilled to be together again in maybe a little bit of an unusual way. You may be watching in your uh, living room or family room, but we're thrilled that God has provided this opportunity for us to celebrate our risen Savior today, this Easter Sunday. And so we are glad that you could join us for that. And we do pray, we've prayed together already before this ser service started, that God would use this medium to draw our hearts, first and foremost, to Christ, but also that we would feel the fellowship of the saints together this day. Let me call us to worship today. I want to use uh, several verses here uh, that come from 1 Peter. God says to us this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Let's worship the Lord together this Easter morning. We will celebrate the resurrection and the gift of salvation through Jesus Christ. Would you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you. And rejoice on this day with inexpressible joy, as we've just read, for the resurrection of Jesus Christ and what that means for us. We thank you for salvation that comes by the blood of Jesus Christ. We thank you for the assurance and the guarantee of our own resurrection as we look to our resurrected Savior. We confess before you today we have fallen short of the glory of God. We have sinned in word and thought and in deed. And it is today that we come and we plead the blood of Jesus upon us. We admit that we are unable to save ourselves in our best days. And so on this day, we look to our Savior for salvation by grace and mercy and by your own love. And so we thank you for the privilege to worship this day. Uh, I pray that our hearts and our minds would be filled by the Spirit of God with the joy of the salvation that comes in Jesus Christ. We give ourselves fully to you for that purpose today. Accomplish what you would in us and through us this day. Draw us near to the throne of grace. We praise you and we thank you and we ask these things today in Jesus' name. I want to read for us today... Um, what we might say is the precursor to the resurrection story. The sermon today will focus on the resurrection, but uh, Roger and Katie are going to come momentarily and they're going to sing a song entitled, Oh, the Deep, Deep Love of Jesus. I want you to hear, not just with your ears, but with your heart, the suffering, the passion, it's called, of Jesus Christ uh, in those hours leading up to his crucifixion. And I want you to see and feel the love of Christ that fills each and every one of those moments as he suffered for you and for me. This is from Mark chapter 15, beginning with verse 16. And the soldiers led him away inside the palace, that is the governor's headquarters, and they called together the whole battalion, and they clothed him in a purple cloak, and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on him. And they began to salute him, Hail, King of the Jews! And they were striking his head with a reed and spitting on him and kneeling down in homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the purple, purple cloak and put his clothes on him, and they led him out to crucify him. And they compelled a passerby, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross. And they brought him to a place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. 
And they crucified him and divided his garments among them, casting lots for them to decide what each should take. And it was the third hour when they crucified him. And the inscription of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. And with him they crucified two robbers, one on his right and one on his left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself and come down from that cross. So also the chief priest with the scribes mocked him to one another, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also reviled him. And when the sixth hour had come and darkness was over the whole land until the ninth hour, and at the ninth hour Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why? Have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, Behold, he is calling Elijah. And someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink, saying, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood facing him saw this, saw in this the way he breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was the Son of God. There was also women looking on from a distance, among whom were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, the younger and of Joseph and Salome. When he was in Galilee, they followed him and ministered to him. And there were also many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. And when evening had come, since it was the day of preparation, that is the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council who was also himself looking for the kingdom of God, took courage and went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate was surprised to hear that he should have already died. And summoning the centurion, he asked him whether he was already dead. And when he learned from the centurion that he was dead, he granted the corpse to Joseph. And Joseph bought a linen shroud and took him down, wrapped him in the linen shroud, and laid him in a tomb that had been cut out of the rock. And he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where they laid him. May God bless to us the reading of his word today.
Amen. Thank you, Roger and Katie, uh, for that. Um, I hope in the reading of the scriptures and hearing those words, we do feel the deep, deep love of Jesus for us today. I want to call your attention again to Mark's gospel. We're going to look at the beginning of the 16th chapter, which picks up uh, from where I finished reading earlier. Uh, But as we get there, I want you to know where we are in the course of Holy Week. We have celebrated this week, um, Maundy Thursday, Uh, we've celebrated Good Friday, and of course this morning we are here for Easter Sunday. But what gets lost in all that, um, there's a much lesser tradition of what's called Holy Saturday. Um, And lots of us, I I know uh, more than one church that I worked for, uh, there was a Maundy Thursday service, maybe a Good Friday service, an Easter Sunday morning service. And the only thing that happened on Saturday sometimes was an Easter egg hunt for the children. Um, It wasn't a particular day of significance. But here's what I was thinking. This Saturday in between the crucifixion of Friday and the resurrection of Sunday um, is a really Um, somber day in the lives of the people were there. And in contrast, think about what Saturday is for most of us. Um, Now, it's probably vastly different depending on where you are, your situation in life, age, all those kinds of things. But Saturday tends to be a day of leisure. In fact, um, I don't know that I've ever heard anybody say, I dread that Saturday is coming. It's usually a day where we get to do many of the things that we enjoy. Now, I know some people work uh, on Saturday. Sometimes Saturday's um, a day of great work, maybe even work at home, yard work, housework, those kinds of things. I was reading some statistics. People tend to sleep more hours on Saturday, so sometimes Saturday uh, is much a day of rest as is Sunday as it was designed. Uh, Also, Saturday can be a day of activities. Um, For those who have kids especially, it can be a day of furious activity, going from baseball fields to soccer fields to the gyms and all those kinds of things. It's a day that we can enjoy outdoor activities when the weather's nice, tennis and golf and uh, walks and runs and all those kinds of things. It also tends to be a family time where whatever may be going on, it's some of the opportunities we have to do things together. There's shopping, there's volunteering, there is serving, there's all kinds of things. It's a day of joy often. Um, Probably almost all of us who are married got married on a Saturday. It tends to be the day that we celebrate big things like that. But contrast all of those things, what an enjoyable day Saturday is to what this particular Saturday uh, is about. In fact, the scriptures record almost nothing of that day. In fact, our reading picks up with when the Sabbath was passed, that means as the sun was rising on Sunday morning, um, the Sabbath now passed that ended the day before. Um, So we don't know what anybody was doing on those days. All these people that have been mentioned, we don't know what they were doing. But I ran across an interesting summary of that day. A preacher named Ray Stedman, and you may recognize his name, uh, gave this summary of that Saturday. Listen to what he says. What a dreary, interminable day it must have been. A day of shattered hopes, of broken dreams, of desolated spirits, and of wounded and frightened hearts. A dark and dreary day indeed, a day in which the future was grim and foreboding. All their brightest hopes had collapsed around them. All their choicest dreams had perished with the death of Jesus. These disciples, crushed, their hopes dashed, their dreams demolished, tried to live through that dark Saturday with no hope for the future, no belief in the resurrection. Every act on that day must have been torture for them. With every fiber of their being crying out, what's the use? Why go on? It was a day they would never forget as long as they live. Think about those people, even the ones that we read about in the earlier scripture reading. That centurion that cried out, truly this, is, this man was the son of God. Had his mind changed 
the very next day when nothing seemed to have happened, Jesus died, was buried, and he may be thinking, was I wrong? Is that all there is to this? Joseph of Arimathea, who showed great courage to go not only before Pilate to ask for the body of Jesus, but went against the ruling council, the Sanhedrin of which he was a part, who were largely responsible for the crucifixion of Jesus, what would it mean for him to, in this act of bravery and courage to request to bury the body of Jesus? What was he thinking that this man, this teacher, this respected leader that he took down from the cross and buried him, what would it mean going forward? Had he sacrificed much for nothing? And what about Mary, the mother of Jesus? She had lost her son the day before. She had watched him mocked and tortured as we read. Maybe she was thinking way back to the days in which she was found to be pregnant and an angel said to her, your child will be the son of God. Did she wonder in her mind, what does that mean if he was the son of God? Why is he now dead and gone? And Mary Magdalene, the Bible tells us Jesus had cast demons out of her. Was she wondering, this man who showed such great power to cast out demons, to calm storms, to even raise the dead, why is he now dead? And maybe one of the most tragic figures on that day would be Peter, living with the guilt of the last words from his lips that we read is, I do not know the man, denied not only his friend, but his Lord Jesus. So what did Saturday mean to these men and women? It meant a dark, a heavy day, absent of hope. But here's the thing. We get to turn the page. The Bible doesn't end at chapter 15. The Bible doesn't end with Jesus in the grave. Jesus doesn't end with Jesus in the grave. The rising sun brought the brightness and the revelation of Resurrection Sunday. We get to read about an empty tomb, a risen Savior. So let's look quickly at three things from chapter 16, just in the first eight verses. I want to look at a surprising work that God does. I want to look at the supreme power of God in these things. And then a stunning or a surprising call upon these witnesses to the resurrection. So first, the surprising work. And I want to put it this way. This surprising work is that God has already done what I can't do. God has already done what I can't do. Now this may seem like a small thing, and I would, I'm would i going to fully admit to you, this is not the full force of this passage. In fact, it's almost just a little aside, but I think it's a point worth making. The problem of the stone is already taken care of. Listen to what I mean by that. Verse 1 in chapter 16, When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. Listen to what verse 3 says. And when they were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? They ask a very good question. They're on the way to the tomb. Chapter 15 said they were witnesses to the burial of Jesus and sealing of the tomb with a large stone. And they're asking themselves, how are we going to get to Jesus in order to anoint him with these spices? But verse 4 says, and looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. I just want to ask us this question this morning. How often do we worry over what appears to be obstacles in our lives, immovable obstacles in our lives? How often is there worry and fretting and um, uh, being downcast in our spirit? How in the world is this going to work out for me? I can't possibly see how I am going to get through this. Well, here's what I know. God has always been in the business of doing what we can't do. 
The surprising work of God is that God has already taken care of much of that stuff that tends to worry us. And he's planned it that way. We go all the way back to the Old Testament. It's almost like a rehearsal over and over and over in God's people, uh, Israel, back in the Old Testament, that God wants them to know that he's doing what they can't do. Think about just the big events in the history of Israel, beginning when they were enslaved in Egypt. And they ask, how can we ever be free? We can't free ourselves. And the exodus comes by the mighty power of God. They get to the desert and they say, we can't get water for ourselves. And water comes from a rock. We're hungry and there's no food and manna falls from heaven. We need meat. We're tired of the manna and meat is provided running into the camp in the miraculous provision of God. Then they get to the promised land and they say, we are too weak to defeat this enemy. And walls fall down and the enemy is handed, delivered, the word is used over and over into their hands. I bet you've sung this little line practically your whole life. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. What does it say? They are weak, but he is strong. I don't think that song's meant to be just about little children physically. I think it's meant to be about God's children. We are always weak, but He is always strong. God meant it to be that way. God wants us to see huge stones that I cannot roll away, but He can and has already done so. 2 Corinthians 12, 9, I hope is a familiar verse to you. Paul says, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. Paul was asking a question to himself. Can I continue with the difficulties that I'm experiencing in my life, even in my own body? And God says to him, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in your weakness. You see, God says the way I designed it is I want you to know that you are weak because I want you to know that I am strong. It goes on to say, therefore, I will boast all the more gladly in my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. I'd say to you this morning, when you can't find the strength, when I can't see a way, when the way forward seems impossible, when my weakness paralyzes me, remember, I belong to him. I am weak, but he is strong. So I want us first and foremost to see the surprising work of God that he has already done. Even the things that I need in the flesh, he has prepared, he has taken care of, he has demonstrated that he is greater than all these things. But most importantly in this resurrection, we see the second thing, the supreme power. We've seen the surprising work of God, but now we see the supreme power of God in a pretty simplistic way. God has done not only what I can't do, but he's done what I can't even conceive of. These women who went to the tomb, and later we read about some of the disciples that go to the tomb, did not expect to find an empty tomb. Even though Jesus had given them some insight into the fact that he would be raised on the third day, their minds and their hearts still didn't believe it, didn't expect it. Jesus had overcome death and sin, we will find out. Verse 5 says, and entering the tomb, that's these women who went to visit the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side dressed in a white robe and they were alarmed. And he said to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. It's the call of Easter Resurrection Day. He has risen. He is not here. You see, these women are the first to witness this pivotal moment in the whole entire history of mankind. Death has been swallowed up in victory, the Bible tells us. God's wrath is satisfied by the 
sacrifice of his own son. And now as a sign of the new life that would come, our sins are paid for. But I always like to remind us, it doesn't mean when our sins are paid for, we get a blank slate. Now in a resurrected, spiritually resurrected life, we now live a new life. You see, once God's wrath is satisfied, the sacrifice is given now, the resurrection, both a physical resurrection, Jesus was resurrected to a real body, but our spiritual resurrection, our new life now, is guaranteed by this resurrection. The resurrection's no afterthought to salvation. Yes, we wear crosses around our neck, we adorn our houses and our churches with them, but the empty tomb is proof that Jesus dying on the cross accomplished our salvation. Imagine these women approaching this grave, seeing that the stone is rolled away. We know from some of the other gospels, they were worried that somebody had taken Jesus. In fact, they even asked, where has he been taken? Their hearts had to be pounding, their minds racing. And no wonder we read in the next verses that they were trembling and astonishment had seized them. It's not what they expected. They were eyewitnesses to a resurrection. They are looking at an empty tomb. And I love that the angel is sitting there and says, He is risen. He's not here. Look, that's where he was. They knew where he was and he wasn't there when they arrived. 1 Corinthians 15 says to us, And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you're still in your sins. You see, the implication of this resurrection reaches into all eternity is that it's the pivotal moment of the salvation of God's people. If he's not raised, then he's not all that we needed. He's not all that he claimed to be. He's not given us eternal life. But he's not in that grave. He wasn't on that day and he's not on this day. He was raised and now sits at the right hand of the Father. So we see the surprising work of God in rolling away stones, things that we thought impossible. We see the supreme power of God doing what we can't even conceive of. And finally we see what I'm going to call a stunning call or a surprising call upon these witnesses. It's a pretty simple thing, because God calls all of us, all children of God, to be witnesses to the resurrection. Think about the people in those moments and hours after this empty tomb is discovered. Peter, the denier, and these women who were surely brokenhearted and downhearted. The disciples who probably were living in disillusionment on this darkened Saturday. Now the brightness of Sunday morning, they experience the power of the resurrection. And the angel says to them, verse 7, But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. He says, Jesus will see you in Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. You see, the angel knows, and he's communicating to these women and later to his disciples, Jesus is all that he said he was. He will do all that he said he would do, including that he would be raised on the third day. And they went out and they fled from the tomb for trembling and astonishment had seized them. No kidding. If we'd been there that day, we'd be no different. And then it says, and they said nothing to anyone for they were afraid. I want you to know this. Um, I think this only means that on the way to tell the disciples that they said nothing. And this afraid is not the fear shrinking away kind of fear. It's the fear, the reverence, and the awe kind of fear. Trembling and astonishment and even fear can be a natural reaction to the revelation of the power of God. In fact, it almost always is in the scriptures that fear follows a revelation of who God is. But he tells them these simple things. First, go. Um, This isn't a place just to sit and gawk at what's happened here. It's to be shared and to share. You've got to go. And we know that same word go is given to us as the Great Commission. Go and make disciples. We go to Jerusalem, Judea, to Samaria, and to the other ends of the earth, Acts chapter 1 tells us. He says, go and tell. That's really 
the job description of every witness to the resurrection, including you and me. Go and tell. It doesn't have to be rehearsed. It doesn't have to necessarily be studied. Look, there is um, practical wisdom in, in knowing and loving the scriptures and knowing theology and knowing all kinds of high-minded things. But our call is simply to go and to tell. And then there's a promise given. You will see him, the angel says. He didn't disappear only to be remembered in stories and legend. In fact, that's a modern version of Christianity that there was a Jesus guy who lived a long time ago and somehow we're supposed to glean some kind of inspiration from his life. If that's all that Jesus was, again, 1 Corinthians 15 tells us we are to be pitied if that's all that Jesus was. If he's not raised from the dead, then what are we doing here this morning? You will see him because he is a risen Savior, a living Savior, just as he said. In a way, we live in this world today in a perpetual Saturday awaiting a glorious event. We're living in what is kind of a dark time in our country, isn't it? Hundreds, if not thousands of people are dying every day of a disease that's running rampant in our country and around the world. We're awaiting an event that will bring to fruition all our hopes and our dreams. And there's probably somebody watching this morning that is thinking, You know, I used to believe all that. I used to think this whole Christianity thing, I used to think this Jesus thing, there was something to it, but it just doesn't feel like it today. It's the darkness of that Saturday before the resurrection. But because of the surprising work of God, the supreme power of God and the stunning call of God, we can face tomorrow. We know who holds the future. We're going to sing a song together in a minute. Because he lives. All fear is gone. And we can face tomorrow because he holds the future. The scriptures tell us that. We're promised that. Romans chapter 8 verse 11 says, If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. Think about that for just a minute. That the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, if we belong to Christ, that same spirit dwells in us. He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit, spirit who dwells in you. The new life that we have is in the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. One more scripture in closing. 1 Peter 1.3 According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. See, our hope is not in a man who lived 2,000 years ago and taught some good things and did some good things. We are born again, Peter tells us, to a living hope. That Jesus is alive and he's active and he is who he said he was and he's done what he said he would do. He has given us forgiveness of sins by his own blood and new life by his own resurrection. And so we celebrate that today. All the future is different. All fear is gone because he lives. Would you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you again on this day for a resurrected Savior in Jesus Christ. I pray that by His own power that today we would know and love Jesus Christ, that you would do a work in us in which we uh, would be changed from the inside out, that we too would be witnesses and we would go and tell of the greatness of our resurrected Savior, Jesus Christ. We glory in that today. We uh, profess our faith in that resurrected Christ and we look for your work going forward in us. We thank you and we praise you for that today. And I ask it in Jesus' name, amen. I hope you'll sing together with us because he lives.
God sent His Son. They called Him Jesus. He came to love, heal and forgive. He lived and died to buy my pardon and empty grave is there to prove my Savior Oh,
Would you pray with me again? Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are indeed what you promised to be, a living Lord, a God who is strong, powerful, compassionate, tender, merciful, gracious, and enduring, and that you can enter our lives and bring us out of darkness into the light, out of the despair into hope, and out of death into resurrection. We pray that many right now in the quietness of their own hearts may be praying to you, asking you to do what you promised to do in their lives, that they too may be born again into a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We thank you and it's in your name we pray. Amen. We wish you a glorious and blessed Easter Sunday. We hope that God has blessed you uh, in the worship today. Would you receive the benediction? May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, may the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen and amen.